Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plots, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Today we have all sorts of garden questions, berries, bugs, ornamentals, and critters. You sent them, now we're answering them. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Joellen Diamond. Joellen is the Landscape Director at the University of Memphis, and Mr. D is here. Howdy. Glad to be here. Hello. Y'all ready? Good. Yes. We have a lot of good questions today. Y'all ready to dive in? We're ready. All right. Let's see what we can do, right? Here's our first viewer email. I have a blueberry that has rusty looking spots on the leaves. Is there a cure for this or should I dig it up? My other blueberries look healthy. This is Miss Jean, Brighton, okay? And here again, blueberries, rusty looking spots on the leaves. Could that be the answer to the question? Could be, mm -hmm. probably is. Probably is. Blueberry leaf rust, uh -huh. it's a, a pretty common problem. Some blueberries are more susceptible to others, so that explains why one of the blueberries has it and the others don't. Okay. Uh, I would hesitate. I wouldn't pull take that plant out. This you got to look at this year. This year was not a typical year. Yes. We had a, lot, a really rainy summer, early, yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. that might have uh, you know exaggerated the problem on that particular variety. Um, you know, you can spray it with fungicides, but uh, uh, not now. I mean, yeah. if it's a problem in the future, you could spray that one blueberry with fungicides, which you know. Nobody likes to do that with blueberries. <laughs> no. Blueberries are, are no. pretty well carefree and you don't have to do a lot with them normally. Um, if it's continues to be a problem, then you might consider taking it out. Uh, but uh, that's blueberry leaf for us is what that sounds yeah. like to me. All right, there you have it, Miss Jean. And just remember um, sanitation with yes. those leaves. Yes, practice good oh. sanitation. So, you all know, right. when they fall down, make sure you collect all of those and get rid of them because you don't want to keep that in the area Correct. for it to, to get back on the leaves. Right. for the next year. Again, thank you, Ms. Jean, for that question. Yeah, we're loving the folks out in Brighton, huh? How about yeah. that? Yeah. All right, here's our next viewer email. With the picture, something is eating my cannas. This is the first year something is eating my leaves. It starts with the new leaves totally destroying my inner plant and flowers. What is it? And this is Francis. Hi, right, Joella. Uh, yeah. We, we've seen that, haven't we? we we've seen that. Haven't That's, we talked about that before, we, maybe? We actually have a clip on it that you could probably find right. on, online. Uh, yeah, there, it's a leaf rollers, mm -hmm. and it's a it's a caterpillar. Right. Very easy to control with BT. Right. Uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, and um, just spray it on there. They'll eat it. The caterpillar ingests that bacteria, and it and it it uh, disrupts them, and they're no longer a problem. Yeah, those things could do a number of cannas. Mm -hmm. they, they roll those leaves up pretty tight. Yeah, you know, they some, really do. Silk, you know, thread. It's pretty tight. Mm -hmm. All right. So it's nothing to be that concerned about. You well, think? well, no, but you know, just when you start seeing it, just control the caterpillar, and you might, uh, you know, just keep a watch on it. Then after that, to make sure there's no others starting to, to do that to your cannas. Okay. Just keep an eye out on keep it. Keep an eye on it. BT PT is easy to apply and a, a real nice, friendly. Yes. Yes, yeah, so a Insecticide natural for yeah, occurring organism. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, so that's for sure. Gives that caterpillar a stomach ache that oh. you not recover from. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Francis, there you have it. Here's our next viewer email. When is the best time to transplant spider lilies? Hmm. This is Audrey at YouTube. All right, so yeah. Joella, what is the best? Don't you have spider I have, lilies? I have spider lilies, yes. <laughs> Beautiful red ones, uh -huh. blooming this time of year. I, I've seen a lot of them you yeah. know, just, uh, it's, recently here. It's, it's, it's this time of year is when yeah. they start blooming. Um, the best time to transplant them would be after they finish blooming. Because okay. then you know these, the stems are still going to be there, so you'll know where the bulbs are to yeah. dig them up. Um, I have known people, because you notice when you see a picture of them, you notice that... Um, there is no foliage at the base of them. Yeah. So the foliage comes out in the spring. 
So that's how you'll know where they are in the spring. But then in the heat of summer, the foliage dies down, and then in the fall, then the flowers come back up. But I'd say either after they finish blooming in the fall, or if you steal them in the spring and with the leaves, then you could dig them up then. Mm. All right, Audrey, there you have it. Here's our next viewer email. How about this one, y'all? Can I use a propane torch to kill all the weed seeds in my garden, Mr. D? What's the look on your face, Mr. D? Come on now. <laughs> Man, I love, I love propane torches. I know you, do. you can do a lot of things with a I propane torch, right. but it's not going to kill all the weed seeds okay. in your garden. All right. It is not going to kill right. all the weed seeds in your garden because uh, most of them are underground. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. when the torch hits the ground, you know, it's, you know, you basically you're taking it, uh, a lot of the competition away and yeah. getting it ready for all, so they all the seeds can germinate and, yeah. and, and, and emerge. <laughs> so no, you can't, you can't kill all the, you know, that's a simple answer. But solarization would work. Huh? Huh? With plastic, you some plastic, clear plastic, it would do better than a torch. And, <laughs> and it would do yeah. better, yeah. And yeah. and what you do is you have to have an air layer. That's what people forget. Okay. There has to be a, a little bit of an air layer between the plastic and the ground, oh. and you leave it there. And I can't remember how many weeks. You're maybe up to six weeks. You're supposed to leave it there. I've seen four to six weeks. Yeah, yeah. And, and and that will kill more weed seeds in the depth you know, uh, that you're going to be trying to disturb to plant right. something in. Right. So you'll get better weed control that way. And the last few weeks would have been a really good oh, time gosh, to do that. Really hot as yeah. it's been, uh, the temperature under there would have... It was, that would have been would perfect. Have there. Yes. Been perfect. Yeah. yeah, that's a good idea though. But here's something else though. When you do use the plastic, do not go back in there and retail. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. yeah. yeah you if you're going to till, till it first yeah. and then do the, your solarization and yes. then be able to plant in it. You're not retail. And I would still put uh, mulches between the aisles or between the plants <laughs> or around the plants because that'll just help control weeds even more. Okay. And add compost to your garden. Yeah, this is true. And much less chance of starting a forest fire. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. All right. <laughs> That's for sure. All right. The old propane torch. How about that? All right. Here's our next viewer email. I have a four-year-old muscadine vine. It is very green and seems healthy. However, there has been no sign of bearing fruit. How can I get my muscadine to bear fruit? Also, when should I prune it? This is Miss Catherine. Hey, Mr. D. You've talked about muscadines a couple of times here. I have. And right. I, so what do you I, think? I, there's probably a very, very good chance that Miss Catherine has a female muscadine. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And the female yeah. muscadine requires cross-pollination uh -huh. with a perfect flowered okay. muscadine. That is probably the, the problem. Unless she has pruned the uh -huh. plant uh -huh. and taken off all the new uh -huh. wood because muscadines fruit on current season's growth. If it's out of one-year-old wood. Uh -huh. So if you take out all of the one-year-old wood, then, then, then you, uh, you know, you take your runners all the way back to where they came out of the the branch. Then you're removing all of. You always leave a couple of one or two nodes on on each of the the runners, uh, and that leaves you some one-year-old wood to fruit from. Okay. So it's either or that you've got a female variety, or you're taking out all of your one-year-old wood, so you can't fruit off of one-year-old wood. It's, it's one or the other, and. Uh, and the, the females are, are great muscadines. Some of the scuppernong is, is uh -huh. a female variety. They're, they're some of the big, you know, some of the really, really nice ones, but you need a perfect flowered one. And there's some good perfect flowered ones out there that don't require cross-pollination, okay. okay. but uh, are required to pollinate the female muscadines. Yeah. I thought you might Very say good. that. Yeah. That's good. It's good stuff. Yeah. All right, well, thank you, Ms. Catherine. Good stuff, Mr. D, I got you. Okay. Oh. Go ahead. When to prune? When late, to prune? Late yes. winter. When to prune? Late winter. When to prune? Late winter. Right, because that's that's important. Right. So right. again, late winter. Late winter, very early spring. Right. Uh, late winter. Okay. Late winter. There you have it, Miss Catherine. All right. Here's our next viewer email. I have a big area of forsythia in my yard. This year we've had lots of rain. About a week ago, I noticed these honey-colored mushrooms at the base of a few of the plants. I scraped them off. I am worried I will lose all the forsythia plants. Can I use some hydrogen peroxide salt spray to stop this from spreading to the other plants? Will mushrooms growing on my facinthia hurt them? This is Madeline Haddonfield. So here's the question. Can she use hydrogen peroxide and, and salt? salt spray? 
Do no. really? No. Huh. <laughs> um, in fact, there is uh, a lot of plants that are, you, they specifically say these plants can stand salt for the coastal areas that have a lot of salt from the ocean. Um, but having extra salt like that in the, in the yard will only, that will do more harm, I think, to the plants than the, the mushrooms are doing. And I wish I had a picture. Yeah, a picture would help. Because yeah. a picture would tell us if there's mulch underneath it. Mm. And if the mushrooms came from the mulch mm -hmm. or if they're actually on the stems of the plant. Right. And the forsythia. Yeah. The forsythia. Mm -hmm. um, did she say, okay, well, you know, I have forsythia too. And big, huge, you know, contain, you know, big bush of it. Well, every few years we cut it down. Mm -hmm. And after it finishes blooming, as soon as it finishes blooming, we'll go and we'll cut all of them down and let them rejuvenate themselves because they're, they come from the base of the plant. Now, cutting them off, I wouldn't cut more than, and leave maybe about, uh, eight to, to 12 mm -hmm. inches, mm -hmm. you know, I would leave, we don't cut them clear to the ground, but we, we cut them close and then let them all rejuvenate. And I'm wondering um, if some of them, if there is mushrooms or something on the stems, right, are they the old stems? Right. Are they old stems? You know, are, have they been in there too long? Have right. you rejuvenated your plant right. yet? Because pruning rejuvenates the plant. Now, I don't know if it's in a lot of shade, but we have had a lot of water and we she's have. right. Um, but I just wondered if there's mulch there, because it could the mushrooms be coming from the mulch because we've had so much rain, or if it's actually older stems that are maybe need decaying. to be taken out yeah, because decaying. maybe that yep. plant needs to be rejuvenated. Yeah. I don't know, right. but that's what I do with mine. I yeah. do cut it down every few years. Okay. Yeah. And I can see that being a concern for her. Anything to add to that? No, th and there is a fungus called honey fungus, which yes. is all malaria, which yeah, does malaria. attack forsythia. Mm -hmm. So uh -huh. it could, you know, but most of the time, it, or a lot of the times, it's injured from a weed eater injury yeah, or something like yeah. that. And, and I, I wonder if something like that could have been part of the problem too. Yeah. But, but uh, you know, I don't know if pictures would be good. Pictures and, would be you know, good. Because uh, yeah. again, you don't know if you have something happened to the plant itself or mulch. Mulch. It's growing in the mulch. Could be mulch. So, right. And it's breaking down and decaying as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So we hope that helps you out, Ms. Madeline. Thank you for the question. Here's our next viewer email. I have a row of blueberry bushes that I feed with an acid fertilizer. How far out from the bushes will this make the soil acidic? I would like to start a vegetable garden next to them. And this is Ms. Sheila, Jolton, Tennessee, okay? Actually, good question. So how far out, Mr. D, does she need to feed those blueberry uh, bushes? The blueberry roots are not gonna take the acidic fertilizer out. Okay. So where you've been putting the fertilizer is probably not gonna be much further other than, you know, there'll be some leaching and it'll move out. You know, a, a, probably a good rule of thumb, I use it for trees and it probably works for blueberries, is one and a half times the height mm. out okay. is where the roots are gonna go. Right. Now, I don't fertilize my blueberries out that far. Mm -mm. You know, I'll go under the drip line and maybe a foot further out and I have, very close to my blueberries, I have blackberries that are getting treated totally different. Mm. My blackberries aren't looking too good though right now. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, but you know, if you want, if you have plenty of room, one and a half times the height. The blueberries six feet tall, so nine feet mm. from the base of the plant, you probably, probably you know, it would be good. But if you're, if you are. Uh, restricted on space, you, you probably would have to squeeze yeah, it. Yeah, because she bit. wants to put in a vegetable garden next right. to them. And it's gonna so need it a high be, pH. Yeah. It's gonna need a high pH. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and is it the downhill or is it uphill? You know, if it's downhill, you may have some, a little bit of leaching of, of the fertilizer, but not a lot because no, you don't put a lot of fertilizer around blueberries and it's not gonna be, a, there's not gonna be a lot of movement outside that root zone, right. I, I wouldn't think. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so not far, because we've, we've you know, seen you do that, you know, to our blueberries that are out, right. you know, in our garden. Yeah, yeah. so it's not very far I don't out. get very far out, it's but, not far out at all. but I do, I don't put it all right under the right. plant either, you know, because mm -hmm. the roots are going to, they're going to go out. Right. I'm look for. Yeah, I have that exact same thing. I have blueberries at the edge of my vegetable garden, and now I don't go as, I don't go the, 
that far out from the blueberries, but my blueberries are, are short too, so they don't need to be a wide area. And what I do is uh, I, they're spaced long enough that I can do a nice long swath of putting acid down, and, mm. and that works, and I've never had any problem. The blueberries are fine, the vegetable garden's fine. fine. Okay. And the plants are going to, the blueberry, when it, those roots go out and it starts hitting a higher pH, they're probably going to yeah. kind of lean toward yeah. back <laughs> toward that <laughs> right. soil. And the vegetables, to some extent, will do the same thing. Mm -hmm. They start hitting acid soil, they're going to start moving toward an area that, that is uh, a little bit more comfortable for them. And, uh, um, you know, you can, you can grow them side by side. So there you have it, Ms. Sheila, you can grow them side by side, okay? All right, here's our next viewer email with a picture. I got into the practice of leaving a no-mow area around my backyard fence for wildflowers and pollinators. All has been fine until recently. I have noticed several holes around my house and backyard fence. I have not witnessed any kind of rodent, but I think I have bows. Do they eat wildflowers and their seeds? How do I get rid of them? I don't want them around my yard. And this is Shay in Hernando, Mississippi. Let's go back to this, this first sentence. There's something here in quotes, okay, that may answer the question for you. I am leaving a no mo area. Hmm, guess who likes no mo areas? Bowls. <laughs> Bowls. Bowls. So what do you think, Joe? Oh, yeah. Huh? Uh, yeah. No mo. Right? She's creating, I mean, the, you know, she's creating a perfect environment perfect. for the yeah. voles to live. She's not only giving them a no-mo area where <laughs> that it's not disturbed so they can, can build their house and, and not have it, but she's also letting wildflowers grow so they have food. Oh, they got a buffet. It, it's, yeah, they're having it's, a good time. It's a perfect storm oh, for a vole. Oh, they a good time. Yeah, yeah right. it's great. <laughs> so what do we do about the bow? So what does she you do? You change your no mo area <laughs> to a mo mo area. To a mo area. mo, okay. Mo <laughs> mo. Mo mo it more. I'd take it down. Yeah, you know, if you don't want, you know, you decide. All right. If All right. you want the wildflowers, you're also going to get the wild critters. Okay. You're going to get the, right. you know, okay. I mean, they, that's, it's, you've got an ecosystem here. <laughs> and uh, if you... I uh, would well, quote, I w don't want the moles around don't my want, house. Yeah. You don't want the moles? The moles. The moles. Yeah, the the you yeah. don't want the moles? Yeah, I want the moles. Take out the habitat. Take out the habitat if you can. Wow. And I'd say, Maybe introduce a snake. Oh. They're the, probably coming in there too. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I control the voles with snakes. Mm -hmm. I have, I have yeah. voles and I have, I saw, I recently just saw a, a little young yellow striped garden snake mm -hmm. in my yard and I'm like, oh, go eat the voles. Yeah, go eat the yeah. voles. <laughs> no. But what are some other means to control the voles though? Oh, well, you can use the rodenticides okay. and you can use traps and things okay. like okay. that, but you're not, you're not, you're, you're, you're not controlling them. Huh. You will be catching a few and you'll be killing a few. Uh, you'll be managing them maybe a little bit, but they're going to come back. You know, you've got the habitat, you've got the, yes. you've got the resources, yes. the food resources, yes. and uh, so they're going to come back. You know, they'll move in there, they'll attract them. You know, it's like, oh, there's a vacant, vacant room wow. there. Come on, it's even got the tunnels already there. How about you know? that? <laughs> so, you know, they'll be back. But, um, so I, I sort of, instead of treating the symptom of the problem, treat the problem. Treat and the, the problem. problem is that no mo area. No mo. No mo zone. All right, mm -hmm. Shay. No mo. According to Mr. D, needs no to be mo, a no mo. Mo mo. <laughs> mo, no mo. mo, no mo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you for that question. Uh, here's our next video email. I have some 60 year old azaleas that bloom well. They have a lot of lichen, white scaly bark on them, and the branches are dying. What can I do to keep the lichen from growing on my azaleas? And this is Bertie from Nashville. All right, so Joel, and there's lichen. Yeah, on the I, branches. I would like, yeah. And there's, with me? there's no problem no. with lichen on branches. Right, That's right. a symbiotic relationship. Okay. It shouldn't be killing the, them, but right. if the branches are dying, it's from something else, and the lichens usually are on decaying right. you know, wood, so there's something else going on. And if they're 60 years old, then you know, you're gonna get some dieback with age. Um, Fertilizing the azalea, that old of an azalea, yeah, and proper years? pruning wow. of it is because you want to. If it's got lichens on it, that means it's shady. Of course, you, azaleas like shade. Maybe it's too heavy a shade. Maybe there's too much water. Right. I mean, they, it's you've got to look at the whole picture. Right. But the lichens are not killing right. 
it's a symptom, but it's, they're not killing the azaleas. Right. The lichens are not the killers. And it would have been real nice to have that picture. Oh, picture just, just would be great. Because I'd like to know how big they yeah, are and big. where they're at. Million? And, oh, wow, and wow, you know, wow. like I said, it just depends. And good pruning, good air circulation through through the plant would be good. And, uh, you know, you don't prune azaleas except after they finish blooming. Right. Um, and then you want a nice angle for, for the bottom of the azalea mm -hmm. at the base should be the furthest out and that you should go at an angle back to the top of the azalea so that the light can get to all the good. areas so you get good, good. Brand, good. do good flowering. Um, so, you know, some good proper pruning, mm -hmm. some thinning maybe, good fertilizing, because you usually fertilize right after you um, prune them. Okay. Same time, usually in, after they finish blooming, you prune them and then you put fertilizer down all at the same time. Ah, right, that's good. Anything to add to that, Mr. D? No, that's pretty much it. I, I, just like you said, the lichens uh, depend on light. Right. And they have algae that that uh, that uh, has to have light. And any time uh, with any kind of plant, when when I see lichens start to grow, that means that it's getting more sunlight. Mm -hmm. It's able to get more sunlight, and so. But they are not taking any nutrition out of the plant. And anything you can do to increase the foliage, to thicken up the foliage, that will reduce the lichens. Uh, and uh, so if you can make the plant healthier, then that's what you're talking about, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. by pruning and nutrition and yeah. those kind of things that will, you know, make the plant healthier, then it will reduce your, your liking. Uh, uh, it's, it's a really interesting relationship, the symbiotic relationship. It is, it's an it? algae and a fungus. And, yes. and, a, and a lichen. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and a yeast. And, uh, it's and, interesting. Uh, and, uh, yeah. But it's not taking any nutrition at all out of the plant that it's on. You yeah. Know? yeah, the fungus yeah. provides the structure. Mm -hmm. And the algae, of course, mm -hmm. the food, the photosynthetic process. So That's it correct. is, it, it's neat. It's a yeah. neat relationship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, Ms. Birdie, thank you for that question. Here's our next viewer email. I have aphids on my common milkweed. How can I get rid of them without harming the monarch caterpillars? Huh. Alejandro, you two. Okay, so he oh, doesn't yeah. want to harm the caterpillars. Oh, and he's right to not want yeah. to harm them. Mm -hmm. um, if the aphids bother him that much, you know, sometimes just washing them off will yeah, work. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you want to, put on a little pair of gloves and just squish, you know, just squish Wipe them a little bit yeah. and then rinse them off. I mean, it, there's, that's the easiest way without applying any kind of yeah, insect, yeah, any kind, yeah, nothing yeah, to yeah, them, yeah. And which I would not do if you've got caterpillars on there. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, just simply washing them off or squishing them. You know, you don't have to do it with your bare hands. You can put on gloves. <laughs> And uh, yeah. that they're they're easy to get rid of that way. What's it? No, that'd be good. You know, and ladybugs, surfeit flies. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I don't think they would bother the, uh -huh. Uh -huh. the monarch caterpillar, and they love aphids. So good that beneficial. may be a case where you yeah, would give you them a little beneficial insect. Buy buy buy, buy, buy some mm -hmm. ladybugs and put them on there. Lacewing, lacewing yeah. flies. Yeah. You know, good stuff. Voracious aphid feeders. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. That may be something you might want to try. Yeah, it's a beneficial. Yeah, especially if you have a lot of them. Squish them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially if you have If a you've lot. got a lot That's of them, sure. and mm -hmm. I think yeah. I would go with the beneficials because mm -hmm. you can purchase those. Yeah. yeah. All right. Appreciate that question, Alejandro. And that seems to be, you know, an aphid species for every plant species. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Golly. All right. Here's our next viewer email. What is the best way to plant hot pepper seeds in an outside garden container without starting the seeds indoors? What is the best fertilizer to use? And this is Darlene right here in Memphis. So we have two questions. Mm -hmm. Best way to plant them, yeah. okay, in a container without starting them indoors. Then the second question, best fertilizer to use. So what do you think? Well, uh, the seeds themselves, the reason why people don't always plant them directly, sow them in a, a pot or a container or outside in the garden is because it takes up to 14 days for them to germinate. Right. So sometimes to 21, 14 to 21 days can be the germination rate, depending on what kind of pepper you've got. And that then it takes longer for it to mature and to get fruit. So that's why they you know, usually use transplants because you'll get fruit faster. Yeah. So that's why people don't. But if you don't, if you do want to do that, I would just you're usually plant twice the depth of the seed. So, I mean, it's, it's not gonna be very much, maybe, yeah. a, maybe a quarter of an inch or something, barely under the ground, but it does need to be dark because they like dark. Um, and then just water it, and I would not fertilize it until after it germinates. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna have a bare area for a while until it 
germinates and then you start seeing the plant and then I would hopefully you would soil test to ah, know if you actually need mm -hmm. to put any fertilizer down right. um, and you know just do what the soil test says because you may just need nitrogen my garden is so overloaded with phosphorus and potassium that I only put nitrogen down now but I knew I know that by having a soil test so it can be done outside it can, it can be done mm -hmm. in a container, in a container. It's, right. it's just you're gonna have to be patient be patient mm -hmm. there you have it Miss Darlene be patient okay this is D. Joel. That was fun, wasn't it? It was. Very good. Was Real good questions. We thank y'all for the questions. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. If you have a gardening question, please drop us a line. We would love to answer it here on the show. Just go to familyplotgarden.com and look for the big Ask Us Your Questions banner. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.